Hello, welcome to the first women show on Talking Cop. It's me, Chris Brack, and I'm here with Emma Sanders from the BBC and Neil Axon from Nanfield Rap. How are we all doing? Very well yeah, indeed. Good, I know, first one in the new first one since the rebrand. So this should be this should be fun. Uh, right, so let's four games in. So how um, so sort of see how, how we feel the, the lay of the land lies. So we're seven points from four games, which for corresponding fixtures last year, that's six points more than what we already have. I don't know. You, I think you can sort of split those four games straight down the middle. I think you got the elation of the Villa and the Arsenal games, which were big, big results, and then the potential frustrations of the Everton game and the uh, the West Ham game. Yeah, I think so. But I think first of all, when you look at it overall, if you'd said to me at the start of the season, given the four fixtures that we had, if we were to take seven points, I'd have snapped your arm off straight away. Um, I would have thought that you know three points against West Ham, maybe some really hard-earned three points against Everton, and then I would have taken a draw against Villa. And I thought I would have thought that would have been a you know an excellent start to the season. So when you look at it like that, I think I'm extremely happy with with Liverpool seven points. Yet, like you say, when you split the games in half, Arsenal and, and Villa, I don't think anyone really expected us to get two wins out of that. Um, so yeah. Terrific results. They massively turned up on the first day to do what they did against Arsenal in front of 55,000 people at the Emirates. Um, just a brilliant all-round performance. Um, the Villa game, maybe they rode their luck a little bit, but again, another really, really good performance. Um, the West Ham game, I actually think Liverpool played very well. They controlled the game, dominated. The main concern for me, well, not concern, but disappointment was probably that you know Liverpool should have been 2-3-0 up before maybe the 70th minute when West Ham kind of started getting going and created a few chances. So that's probably the biggest disappointment. And then the Everton game, I've spoken about this before, they just didn't really turn up. They weren't at their level. Everton, who have had a rough start to the season, did. Um, And yeah, that was one of those games where you just go, move on, because it just didn't work. Whereas at least they did play well in, uh, in the West Ham game. They kind of responded from the Everton um, result with a good performance and unfortunately didn't get the three points. But yeah, overall, I'm 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 really happy. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, Neil, I don't know about you. I'm still over the derby. I just can't. <laughs> I'm sick of losing home derbies. You know, I could do big picture. Uh, you did some brilliant work with uh, Alison McGovern, who is very good at seeing big picture. And you know, and getting that many people to Anfield, you know, get more games at Anfield are all positives, and that is the bigger picture. And we want to do more games at Anfield, but it's crap losing a derby though. It's really yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, that conversation, that show was dead interesting because there was there was me, John, and Philippa uh, on the one hand who were um, just devastated by the results by the turn of events, and then there was Alison and Josh who were able to do the sort of the big picture uh, overview and also talk about the the mosaic for Natasha Dowie and its significance, mm. its cultural significance, which was massive. But it's rubbish getting beat by Everton, and it's something that you know we should be strongly against um, at every single level. But it was more for me; it wasn't even just the the beat, the getting beat by Everton aspect, which was obviously, you know, a real blow. It was also that there was just there was just a, a window of them going nine from nine, which would have opened up a window for them going twelve from twelve. And that's not in the universe where you know that this isn't. And then they could have gone on and challenged for the title because I just don't think that's the case. But what they could have done was, you know, if if they can get if you can get that run of results. Then first and foremost, it's just so much belief for everyone, you know, going on a, a mini run of, of of four victories. But it also, I think, would have electrified uh, a little bit of the conversation around them. Uh, and then the next level of that as well would have been it just puts them into some rarefied air that they'd not been in. And that was what I think was on the table actually at Anfield. The idea of winning that game at Anfield, and, and let's be clear about this, I still don't think it was offside uh, to go no, one from a Liverpool point of view. And I think that if that does stand, then the adrenaline boost that that gives everyone, you know, the ultimate thing that Everton do well in the game versus Liverpool is they just almost let Liverpool punch that first 15 minutes out in the end. But I don't think that's much science in there. I think they get to sort of 10, realise they're going to have to stick for five more and then realise they can then push the other way. Whereas if Liverpool have gone one nil up, I think it's all very, very different. And and from there, I think they possibly go on. And, and I think that that, you know, at some point we want some, we expect or more accurately hope that some of these players will be part of a Liverpool team that can go on a big win and run uh, towards getting to the top of the table. And it would have been nice if some of them had just had a little bit of a preview of that because I think that that was, that was what was on offer. Uh, that Everton game being backed up with the West Ham game, I think that that was what was on offer. So, 
listen, it, it's it's the two pronged disappointment of that. The idea of not being able to watch Liverpool win at Anfield. Forget the opposition for a second. Win at Anfield on the telly to go nine from nine and send what would have felt like a bit of a message out. Um, and then the idea, obviously, if it's another home derby, which they failed to win. And I do sort of think that the next phase on this is the next time there is a big home game for Liverpool uh, at Anfield. I think they do need to have a little bit of a think. And, rem- and not just, not least because look at what Liverpool do to Arsenal. You're in a situation where the pressure's off the team who are not expected to win, who are not the home team in those instances. And then we've got the added pressure, I think, where you are doing this thing where you're a bit like, well, you've got to play well because it's 55,000 people and we want them to come back and we want them to come to Prenton Park. That's not a pressure that's on Liverpool's men's team ever. Liverpool's men's team don't go on the pitch when they play a home game against, say, Toulouse, where there's this thing in the back of the minds, which is, if we don't win this, people might not come the next one. Or if we don't win this, we're, we're letting something down, some notion of something down. They just get to play a game of football in an, in an environment in a stadium that they're used to. So I think having a little think about this one before the next one, I don't think it is as easy as we'll just don't have it be Everton. Because I think if you, for instance, had it be, um, let's say, Bristol City, well, it's it's the biggest occasion of the women who play for Bristol City's sport in life to date, going right. and playing at Anfield. Mm-hmm. So the, And also they get to go into it and feel like, well, it's a free hit for us. The pressure's all on them. And there is something in that. And I think I think sort of I think that this isn't just a Liverpool problem. I think it's a little thing that the women's game needs to think about. All of that said, Emma's point around you'd have took seven from twelve is spot on. You'd have expected them to be spread a little bit differently is spot on. The underlying numbers still have Liverpool the idea of can Liverpool come somewhere between fifth and eighth. Um, that's still in there and that's still in the conversation when you do look at, at what it is the table's telling you. So that's important too. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of just needing to take a little bit of a breath, be a little bit grown up about it, do sort of point out that they're not that far off elite numbers in terms of statistics where it's about stopping the opposition, defending, stopping counter-attacks, not conceding many chances. You know, they're not that far off elite numbers in there. And that's a massive positive as well. And it suggests that this form can, uh, to a degree, continue. So I think all in, there's, there's so much to be pleased about and positive about on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, it is just sort of worth saying that, you know, maybe come the end of the season, not in a grand way because there's absolutely no chance of Liverpool, I think, being embroiled in anything at the bottom. But we may just feel as though there was a little bit of a little bit of a, an opportunity missed. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, Emma, we'll, we'll come back to the game shortly, but uh, let's talk about Tash Dowie. You know, massive mosaic uh, for her to celebrate her 47 goals for Liverpool. She's now a Liverpool ambassador, first female Football to be a Liverpool ambassador. These are all big positive steps, which we should be seeing in the game. For you know, for people who, and as I didn't get to see the touchdown play in a, in a peak, I sort of came into the women's game a, a bit later. You know, this is an, an elite striker we had. You know, she helped Liverpool win titles. You know, she scored goals all around the world. You know, it was nice that in the end she ended her career at the club she loves. Yeah, definitely. And I, I spoke to her about that exact point that you made at the end there about her being able to choose to finish her career at Liverpool and kind of doing full circle and as you say she's not just you know one of the greatest strikers in Liverpool's history but in the WSL's history she's definitely one of the most prolific strikers and goal scorers so um, it was really nice for her to have that moment I saw her briefly before she went into Anfield actually with with Becky Easton um, obviously a former Liverpool and Everton player her, her partner and I saw them both before going in and she was just really excited because she's the fact she's a Liverpool fan, you know, she she sees Anfield as a magical place, like what we all do. And she gets the buzz and the enjoyment every time she goes into that stadium. And she now gets to do that um, for her job on, you know, a, a weekly basis. So to be able to have that moment in a stadium like Anfield, where you have Liverpool fans who have followed her journey coming out and having a guard of honour for you know, in a Merseyside in a Merseyside derby for her for her career for her achievements, I just think is so 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 special for her individually. Um, but as as Neil was referring to that uh, before, and you were Chris about that conversation um, around sort of the wider impact of that is, I think it's so important that we're achieving women, uh, we're celebrating the achievements of women on stages like Anfield that has so much history and so much celebration of success. It, we haven't had too much of that covering the women's game. So I think it's really important that that not only was, you know, seen on TV in that moment, but also it, it will go down as, 
it's kind of a moment that happened at Anfield and, you know, in, in a Merseyside derby. And, yeah, I, I'm just delighted for her because she absolutely deserves that. Yeah, definitely. Full, fully deserves it. You know, and it's things that should happen more often now, you know, for, mm. you know, if you achieve what Tash Dowie achieves, you know, it wasn't surprised if uh, Gemma Bonner is going along that, could go along that route, you know, uh, winning two titles at Liverpool, you know, not many people, not many people see that as a captain. So, you know, that, again, that could be the next cap off the rank, if, you know, rightfully so. So let's sort of talk about the sacks because, you know, we've got to see a few of them now. Obviously, injuries have sort of curtailed what we've seen, seen about a few of the others. But, Neil, let's talk about Jenna Clark because she's just been ridiculously brilliant for us. Yeah, she's enormous. And she's <laughs> doing the absolute business uh, game in, game out. And I think that that's part of Liverpool being close to, as I said before, sort of elite level defender and stability. Um, I think that the structure is that way. And I think it's worth remembering that. And that's maybe the the next phase of this is is working out how to not quite have it air on that side quite as much and get some opportunities in. But what she's been able to show game in, game out, Jenna Clark has been just absolutely tremendous. I think that it's she looks like an all-round footballer, which is the first, you know, which is my first sort of note on this. She looks like like a player. It isn't about the fact that she's obviously able to dominate in a couple of areas of the pitch. She's just also got this over overarching ability to, for instance, you know, I don't think anyone's got past her yet. I don't think I've seen anyone get past her yet when, when she's had to stand them up and do some active defending. It's not just the idea that she's there nodding things away. It looks to me as though she's there and she's able to stand someone up and nick the ball off them and block them and just basically hold them up, at the very least hold them up, but also stride away with it much of the time as well. I think you've got to see a range of passing from her. I think she looks as though she can get Liverpool moving from back to front really impressively. And I think that that's a, a big deal in terms of maybe beginning to shift the dial of this Liverpool team a little bit. Is there an argument to find ways just to move the ball a little quicker through the phases from time to time? She looks as though she could really help with that. Uh, but for now, she's done all the bread and butter stuff ever so well. A game in, game out. Um, I, as I say, it's, I don't, I don't know if she's even given a foul away. From when I've seen it, I can't remember a moment where she's even given a foul mm -hmm. away. So you've got a, you've got a player here who's very, very difficult to get past, excellent in the air, and who doesn't look as though she can be tempted into errors, um, mistakes, um, anything like that. So I think that you know Liverpool have, have got a bedrock with her, which I think gives them a lot to go on, uh, and, and to keep the development and the improvement coming because I think that that is sort of the next thing with this. It's worth saying that when we do talk about these new signings, it still isn't a ton of games that they've all had together. You know, it still isn't this idea that they've, you know, they're, they're still finding bits of this out and it may well take until we get halfway through this campaign as maybe it did to a certain extent last season for the players to all absolutely bed themselves down and in but then hopefully we get to see, you know, the strengths and we can play to some of those strengths a little bit more, which, as I say, might lead me and Liverpool feel as though they can they can take a couple more risks in attack because of the quality of the defender they've got. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, she feels like one of those players that she, I think all good players have this about them is she always feels like she's got more time than anybody else on the ball. Mm. I mean, she, I think a, a character, she's naturally unflustered. She seems that sort of character, which is help, helpful for a centre-back. But, but that back three now, her... Uh, Gemma Bonner and Oliver Sal and Grace Fisk, it just looks a, an ideal unit where you are looking going, I don't really see how you break that up, barring touch wood, there's no injuries. It just seems to have the perfect balance at the moment, those three. Yeah, and I, I wanted to highlight Grace Fisk actually, because obviously she's another summer signing that's come in and um, Jenna Clark has been the one that rightly so because of all the reasons that Neil's just listed there has kind of been, you know, the one that's been praised by supporters, but I've been very, very impressed with Grace as well. I think she's gone about her business um, kind of under the radar, actually. Um, I think that back three, obviously, this was something that Beardy sort of experimented with in the championship. We saw it sort of put to the test in the WSL for the first time last season. Um, and there was times where it got exploited. But um, so far this year, that back three looks really, really solid because you've got Gemma Bonner, who's um, an out and out leader. She's obviously experienced and she's a you know, kind of a stonewall defender, really. And then you've got ball players like Jenna Clark and Grace Fisk either side of her. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, what Neil says there about progressing from the back, I think that's something that Grace Fisk massively brings to the side. And I was really excited to see what she could do with the ball. Um, she was very, very successful at West Ham, playing alongside Lucy Parker, the England international 
those two were excellent at playing out from the back. Um, and I think Grace has brought that so far to Liverpool. I still think, you know, there's there's improvements there. But with her and, and Jenna at that back, that in that back line with the experience and then out of, of Gemma Bonner, I think is, yeah, a real boost to kind of not just Liverpool's defensive solidity, but how they can build play from the back. I think it's interesting in the Merseyside derby when he needs to chase the game. What He takes Bonner off. Mm. Go brings Jazz Matthews on, goes to a more sort of conventional back four, but it's Fisky moves to right back from left hand mm. side at centre half. Yeah. So I thought that straight away said, you know, first and foremost, he feels as though, you know, I think that she's not as progressive when she played in that area as, as Covisto is, but he was prepared to trust the idea that she can play enough. Uh, at right back, progressed the ball well enough, both carrying it in terms of also passing it forward as well, because that's what Liverpool needs to do at that point. They were chasing the game. So he backs the solidity on the one hand. It is a centre half he keeps on the pitch, but on the other hand, it's the one that he's prepared to say, go and be more progressive, go and put, use the ball a little bit more. And to me, I think that's a bit of a tale as to the way Liverpool see Fisk. And the other part of this as well is that she obviously swaps sides. So I think that that also shows that there's there's a technical versatility there that Bian might well be able to use over the over the course of the season a little bit. I do, you know, part of this, you know, is the room to, you're saying there, Chris, you wouldn't want to break them up. And I think I do agree with that. And also a little bit of this is the conversation of what is the manager's job over the course of this campaign. His job, first and foremost, is to ensure Liverpool are going to retain a WSL status as high in the league as possible. But I do wonder if, in terms of breaking them up, um, as we get sort of deeper into the winter, if Liverpool can get a few more points on the board, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to see Liverpool occasionally go with a back four in a few yeah. games and just get another attacking player on the pitch and accept that, therefore, it might be a little leakier, except that if you go with Fisk and Clark, the two of them might have a bit more defending to do and that there might be a little bit more organisation required from the two of them because I think at the minute that's the major thing that Bonner's bringing, obviously, along with her own defending ability. She's very much able to talk these two younger players through the game. But as you said before, you know, Gemma is getting towards the tail end of her career. Nifar, he's getting towards the tail end of her career. And at some point, Liverpool might want to look at these two and say, right, are they going to be the rock we're going to build this on? And if so, does that allow us to keep the fullbacks high and maybe add another attacking footballer, another midfielder, another another forward who helps us look after the ball a little bit more? Maybe that's something we get to see at Prenton Park against a few of the sides that we, we you know, at Bristol City, or someone like that who we expect to see finish sort of low down. Maybe that's the time to do that from the start and not just have it as a break glass option. But it also then leads to what we've been screaming out for for years, uh, as ever knows, because she has to put up with me. Um, strength and depth, where you are sat there yeah. going, ah, oh, Joe, Jasmas and Joe Bonner on the bench. Well, they, they can't get inside at the moment. We might, and, you know, and, Cam- and Neve as well, Neve Fahey as and well. Neve, you know, it's, a good, I mean. it's a good set of five centre backs, that, that six centre backs, sorry, yeah. that they've ended up with. Yeah. Whereas it wasn't, it, it was only a couple of years ago where you were literally going like, one injury at the back, you're going, oh, I generally don't know who we're going to play at the back here. Yeah. It would either be a youngster who possibly wasn't ready, it was unfair. Or it was we have to play someone out of position. Yeah, and also yeah. that 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 versatility that, that Neil just mentioned, particularly on Grace Fisk as a as a right back. You know, you look at last season, and if Emma Corvisto got injured, then you know I'd, I'd I'd have been quite concerned about sort of being quite weak in that area. Now I'm I'm not I'm not worried. Yes, you know, ideally you don't want to have to break away from that back three, but the fact that we can play with a back four and there's four extremely capable players there, and Grace Fisk can be a backup for Emma Corvisto as well. Um, there, there's just more options there, and I think the fact that you know the Merseyside Derby classic example that Matt Beer can switch things up during a game. Two seasons ago, there there was there was no way he could have done that effectively in the WSL with the squad that we had coming up. Whereas now, um, yeah, I think I think he can do that, and it's and it's you know certainly not a massive concern. Yeah, and also Emma Coe, so because she's so talented, can also switch to the left if you wanted yeah. to give Taylor Hines a rest. So you know Matt has got that quality versatility, which is what we need. I mean, going to the midfield, um, this is where Emma and Philip have both corrected me when they said keep an eye out for Mary Hob- Hobbinger uh, or Herbie to everyone if you've yeah. in the crowd. Said like, trust me, Chris. She'll be starting, uh, and it'll be a battle for who plays alongside her. Won't be the first time I'm wrong. I'm quite happy to be wrong. She loves a goal as well, doesn't she, Emma? Yeah, she's been absolutely brilliant. She scored again in the international break. If people haven't followed her, um, so yeah, again, she's been she's been wonderful. And I just think she's given so much to this team. Obviously, we saw what Nagano could do in particularly the set like the second half of last season. Fuka Nagano was was excellent for Liverpool and transform the way that the team played. 
Um, I'm sure we'll come on to this in a little bit, but in terms of the, the tactics of the way that Liverpool play through the midfield. But I think I think um, Hob- Hobbinger's introduction has allowed Kerry Holland's role to adapt and be more effective. We're getting the best out of Fuka Nagano as well. And yeah, Hobbinger's, I think her passing range is brilliant. Um, she's great in that sort of deeper role where she can see the game in front of her. She sees passes that other players don't. Um, she creates chances. And she's, she's just got that little bit of spark that I think, you know, Liverpool, they they had with Nagano. Um, we know what, what Holland can do, but I think you look at Holland as more of a box-to-box, whereas Hovinger is that little magician, I guess. Um, she can do do little moments or do little things that can just turn the game. So, you know, it can, it can give you a swing of momentum. If Liverpool perhaps have struggled to keep the ball for five minutes, she's got that technical ability to do that, turn a player quickly and just get an attack going, get the crowd going. And I think that's really, really important for a team like Liverpool, where you know they go into the places like the Emirates and they're playing away from home against these big teams. And she's yeah, she's got that sort of that um that that flash about her, which which I which I like. I, I like in, in midfield players. I think she's got this this little ability. She can help Liverpool be compact, but she can also help them be more expansive. Uh and mm-hmm. I think that, that she can go and sit next to Fuka for a period, so can Kerry. They can help soak up a little bit of pressure and then it's the idea of okay but now it's our turn to play more on the front foot and then she can get away from Fuka and be able to create and be be, be a threat around the penalty area I think that's exciting for Liverpool I think it'll still take you know I think it's still stuff that they'll be looking to hone a little bit more and I think there's still a, a mild question as to what the, 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 then doing with the next line beyond that I think that's something that's that's a little bit up in the air as to how they're not all going to end up on top of each other I thought that was one of my sort of takeaways from from the derby really was that when it goes a little bit wrong when it gets a little bit harder they can end up just looking almost like a bit of a flat six so you've got that three then you've got Fuka, and then you've almost got six of them and no one's sort of desperately getting in behind the fullbacks aren't pushed super high everyone sort of collapses in a teeny little bit and it's something that i think they'll want to work on uh because i think they want to stay compact they want to move up as a team but you can't always do that or more accurately sometimes you need to stay compact because you've got yourself a focal point that then allows everyone to come up and compact it but further up the pitch i think progressing all the way through the pitch all the time it just gives you it just makes playing football a little bit harder but I think Hobinger is part of that. You know, the major thing that she has is the idea that if Liverpool can get time around the penalty area between her and Fuka in terms of what they can do with the ball, and then Kerry, Taylor, Emma Covisto, in terms of what they can do with movement to then progress beyond them with the next phase, I think I think it's it, it's a good place for Liverpool to be. It's just going to be this conversation about what phases Liverpool through through different bits of the pitch at different times. But I think that she lo- obviously looks exciting and. She's one where, again, you know, we're now talking here about only about four league games. I think that, again, we'll be talking about a player who looks even more settled when we begin to get to 12, 13, 14 league games and be able to really see what she can do. Yeah, it's going back to, Neil, that you talked about in the past, uh, the, the whole Rafa Blanket thing, which is there's only so many people you can cover, whereas now, it's at least for midfield, it's like, well, we can stop Kerry, we can stop Fuka, but you've got to stop Hobbinger as well. So yeah. it, it gives you that, whereas before, maybe... Liverpool only had the two big options in the middle. Now it's three options. Plus you still yeah. got the villain guards coming and things like that. So it's just that options thing again, which we've not probably had in the last couple yeah. of years. The options, the options help, but I think within that, Liverpool have got to therefore make sure that the options are working for them on the pitch as well. Uh, yeah. And it's it's about as I think you know. Ultimately, Liverpool, you don't want to get into a situation where this is the case. But I feel as though if you know, if you've got Hobinger around the opposition penalty area, you are going to create things. You're going to make things happen. But that means you've got to get around that penalty area. So that's the that's the job that they've got, really. I think that remains sort of the challenge. I think when I think they can get a lot of good football under control in the opposition final third. When they're in the final third, getting to the final third on mass has been, I think, the thing that, for instance, you see a tail off in the Merseyside Derby. I think you see a tail off in the game against West Ham, where for a period they were finding that quite straightforward. And then suddenly, whether it's not West Ham change a thing or two, or whether it's that Liverpool tyre a little bit. But what you're seeing with Hobinger is that when Liverpool do get there, she looks like she's got both goals and assists in abundance. So I think that, you know, Liverpool thinking about what that journey is and maybe what needs to be a little bit different to be able to put her in that position where she can be that creative more often, I think will I think it'll really, really bear fruit for Liverpool. It just, as I say, it may take just a little bit more time and maybe it'll just take a, a few more games that are at home that are a bit more straightforward as well to be able to get to see it. Yeah. So, Emma, sort of going into the attack then, this is probably the most injury-hit area of, of the team, which is also what makes, if we think of 
seven points from four games. Even more impressive, as in, we've got Super Roman Hag, who broke her, was it her eye socket? Um, or yeah, her nose? Well, we still didn't get confirmation, yeah. Face injury. <laughs> Face injury. She basically has to wear a mask now. So, you know, that's how, how bad it was. Um, we've got Young Mir Enderby, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, Tash Flint, who came off the bench, but I think she was suffering from illness. And then our other attacking options at the moment, you know, are either recovering from injuries, you know, poorly and Keenan still has just not got had, had any luck with this ankle injury. And the, the big positive, obviously, Mel Lawley came back earlier than expected, but it's going to take her a few weeks to sort of get up and running because, you know, it was, it was a big injury. But the three new new signs, I'd probably say Tash Flint and Mia Enderby were probably seen the most of, you would yeah. probably say. Yeah, I mean, Tash Flint was obviously brought in to kind of provide a bit of competition in that in that number nine, <coughs> sorry, in that number nine role. And what we've seen her do for teams in the past is score goals in the six yard area. And that's something that um, was very, very opposite to kind of you, Katie Stengel, your, um, your Sophie Roman Hag is someone who literally will op operate in those very, very small um, sort of dimensions and she's just always in the right place at the right time and she's just just got that that instinct I think she's shown that obviously she got the goal against Arsenal um she got the goal against Leicester in in the in the Conti Cup no sorry she, did, she didn't score against Arsenal but um yeah she scored in the Conti Cup and it was Villa she scored against Villa she scored, yeah um so she's already you know two goals in in sort of five games in all competitions and she's only started I think the cup game and um, maybe the game against Villa um so yeah she's I, I think she's done her job very well actually um I think for her to be on the score sheet is kind of a bit of a bonus really for Liverpool because yeah like I said I think she was brought in more to provide competition so the fact that she is coming on and, and getting getting a few goals here and there is nice to see um so yeah I've been pretty pretty happy with with Tash so far and then Mia obviously is is a very very young player she was brought in for the future she's not for the now and in a way, she's kind of been thrust in the deep end because of those injuries that you've listed. Um, so I kind of didn't really have any any expectations from her, but she's shown glimpses of what she can do. We know that um, technically she, she's a good player. Um, I still think, you know, there's areas to improve in her movement, in her positioning. Um, I, I think she obviously just kind of lacks that game intelligence because purely down to the fact that she is young and inexperienced and that will come with time. Um, but in terms of her actual ability, we, we can see that, and that's exciting. So, yeah, I think both have done a both have done a good job so far. And um, Sophie's the one for me that I think all eyes are on. Really, um, yeah, as you say, she had that face injury. She came on for her, you know, for a full debut in the most side derby at Anfield. I mean, what a hard kind of place to make your debut. And she obviously had the face mask, and I thought she really struggled. I don't know whether she could, you know, whether her her vision was, you know, was affected by the face mask. I've spoken to players in the past, the likes of Lauren Hemp, and I remember Sun Sun Kyung Min suffered, uh, struggled with it during during the World Cup. So I think that's really really tough to come on and make your debut, and you're not comfortable, and and it sort of looked that way. Um, I didn't actually see the full West Ham game because um, I was working on another game, so I can only take what I've seen from bits. And um, she looked like she, you know, improved, but you know, probably still struggled a little bit. So it was very, yeah. it was very neat and tidy. Yeah, very, I very. It, I think it's two games. They sort of fill the way into the that, well, that's world, it. Role, new country. So you know, with a face mask on. So you know, yeah, that, that's that's now. it. Yeah, that's kind of the point. Is that it's like she's kind of she's shown glimpses, but she's not had any time to really show what she can do without those discomforts. So she's very much still one that I'm looking forward to seeing because. You know the signs from training before getting the face injury were were really really encouraging and yeah I, I think she will be a wonderful player for Liverpool and I think we just need to give her that time and just be a bit patient and she needs to work out the connections with the midfielders and obviously you know with so many forwards being out I guess it's hard for her to figure out how the team are going to be playing when you're playing with different forwards every week because some are coming back from injury some are still injured you know, you've got young players who are still finding their feet as well. So there's a whole combination of factors there. And um yeah, I, I have no concerns that that she will that she will do well for Liverpool. On Enderby, I think that I think that there looks looks to be a lot of a really high ceiling and a ton of potential. I think that just little 
dynamic moments that you've got to see so far have been exciting. I think with Flint, it looks as though she's prepared to work ever so hard. And if the ball can break to her in the penalty area, she looks as though she's got it. She's got a good eye for it. For Sophie Roman Hag, I think it's I think there's there is a couple of questions about how Liverpool want to use her um and how they want to play. Again, we're only two starts in, so you don't want to get carried away. But I think she's another one who possibly I, I, you know, I feel as though she could strike up a really interesting partnership with Leanne Kiernan if they can get Leanne Kiernan back fit. I think that that would that gives you a, a little bit of both. I think she seems to me to be a player who's full of poise, but you therefore need to be able to make the pitch big. I think in order to be able to let her find little pockets of space where she can influence, bring other players in. Liverpool, have, as we've discussed, got two really strong midfield runners and goal scorers in 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 Holland and Hobinger. So I just, you know. I feel as though Liverpool could do with trying to find a way to get someone ahead of her uh, on a regular basis, just from the snapshot that I've seen in terms of the two games. You know, it is talk here just talking about two games, and I think it's important to 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 underline that that it, it may well be that it, Liverpool will make it work a little bit differently. But I think she's another one who, who potentially could do with the being a, a a focal point to play to, who can who can push down channels and so on and so forth. But, you know, Liverpool have got opportunity to to work that out now across the next batch of games. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm just looking at this year versus last year's, we're sort of seeing a bit of a... Last year was very much, it was five at the back, the two midfield and three up front. That was the formation that won the championship. That was the formation we stuck with for the majority of last season. Now, I don't think this is partly because of injuries or, you know, the players got there, but we have gone to more of like a... Still kept the back five, but it's definitely... A, a definitive three midfield and it's even been a two up front now at the moment one of the two up front has been um missy bow you know missy bow has been sometimes asked to play as the number nine or drop in as a 10 now that's part of because of who we've got available so you know she's had you know she's done done that sort of work really well for us do we sort of feel that's the way going forward or do we, do we feel like we've discussed with neil and yourself is do we do we look at this back four and find a way of getting another attacking option on yeah, well, I, th- I think the idea is to be able to to have both formations and switch between two in games. I think that's the idea. I think that's becoming more and more common now, not just in the WSL, but in women's football as a whole, because tactically the game has advanced so much, even in the space of, you know, three, four years. You look at the likes of like the Lionesses, for example, Serena Wiegmann is now doing that. They won the whole Euros having not changed the side and playing literally the same formation. And now they're swapping formations and they're changing you know, defensive lineups in games because tactically the game has just gone to another level now. And I think that's what Matt Beard wants is he wants his team to be able to play in different formations and and different strategies. And um, so far we've seen that, yeah, probably that back three from the start, which Liverpool started all of their games with that back three, which obviously moves to to a back five um, kind of out of possession. Um, That has obviously worked from the start. Um, and I think what it is now is just making sure that in those moments where you might just want to fall back into a back four or you're trying to manage your game, you know, West Ham, for example, that's where the nuance is. And that's where I think the details just need to be refined because that hasn't quite been worked out yet. But what I have liked so far, and we've touched on this obviously already, is the fact that we look more progressive from the back. Yeah. Um, we didn't do that enough last season. And I think that is massively down to the personnel that we brought in. Um, and I think the recruitment team, and obviously Matt Beard, who leads that, I think deserve a lot of credit for bringing in Grace Fisk and and obviously Jenna Clark. And you forget Jenna Clark was a player that was playing the Scottish Premier League. And some people might, you know, turn their nose up at the Scottish Premier League, not see it as as you know a standard for a team that wants to be finishing fifth in the WSL. But you know, clearly Jenna Clark is more than capable of playing um, at the top end of the WSL. So um, that's great work from the scouting team. And also Grace Fisk, who's obviously very experienced in the WSL, been around for a while with West Ham. Um, She was coming to the end of her contract. Now, I know that there were several clubs that were interested in Grace Fisk because why would you not be? And Liverpool did their business extremely early and got her in the bag. So I think that has obviously had a massive impact on the way that Liverpool play from the back is the personnel that they brought in. And then kind of what we, you know, sort of touched on on that midfield area is, I think Kerry Holland's been playing more advanced this season as well because you have got the likes of, of obviously Hovinjo and and obviously Nagano in there. And I think we're now getting the best out of Kerry Holland because, you know, with that front line kind of having a lot of movement, what we have seen maybe in some occasions is almost Kerry playing in like another 10 for kind of 10-minute mm. periods, 20-minute periods. I think, you know, naturally 
number eight, she sort of slots into that role on a weekly basis. But actually, I I like her when she plays more advanced and she seems like she's slotting into a kind of a, as a number 10 more often now. And, and I really, really like that. And I think that for me is quite exciting. And going forward, when we do get those forwards back, I'm 100% with Neil. I would love to see Leanne Kernan and Sophie Roman Hag playing up top together with Kerry in that sort of attacking, almost like a number 10 role. I think that would be really, really exciting. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So we'll come back to Liverpool in a minute. Just WSL as, as a whole, Emma, just to start. Um, he surprises at the moment. You know, I think Tottenham have started really well with the third at the moment. Um, probably Villa and Everton, probably, especially Villa, probably not the, spot, the start we expected. Now it's four games in, so give it a couple of give it a couple, a couple of games. You can look very silly, but I think Villa have had probably a disappointing start. Probably not the start we expected from them, and. Leicester have done really well. I think Leicester are currently fifth at the moment, so, you know, and we've sort of seen this upturn in Leicester since probably since the turn of the year when they brought yeah. Willie Kirk in, and it's just Leicester just look a different entity to what they were probably this time last year. Yeah, well, Leicester again did some wonderful business in the transfer window. Willie Kirk, I've you know I've sung his praises all season and and last season as well. I think he's one of the best managers in the WSL and has been for a long, long time, and he's proving that at Leicester. Um, they've got a really nice blend of sort of the experienced players that he's brought in and then they've got some really, really good young talent and he's just allowing them to play and he's given them the belief and the confidence. So well done to them because I think they've had an excellent start. I do imagine that they will fall off, you know, they'll tail off towards the end of the season and I think mid-tables probably, I think that's where I predicted that they'll finish and I, I'd expect them to finish there. Um, but if they can maintain this, then, you know, fair play to them because I don't think anyone was, you know, would have seen them kind of finishing above the top six for sure. Um, so great start for them. Tottenham, as you mentioned, just like the men's team, um, they're playing with a lot more sort of kind of attacking creativity this season. I think Robert Villahan's got the best out of their their players on an individual level. Um and yeah, they've Martha Thomas again, new signing that came in in the summer from Manchester United. She's been excellent for them, got a hat trick in their last game against Villa, which was a big, big win for them. So yeah, they're, they're doing really well. Villa, I think for me, obviously, you looked, you looked at their fixtures at the start of the season. And yes, I, don't, I didn't expect them to lose all of their games, but I certainly didn't expect them to get off to a flying start. And I still think they will finish fifth. Um, I genuinely do believe that um, because they, they've got too good of a squad to to not pick up the points. But, you know, they've played the top last season's top three in their first four games. You know, Man United obviously was a really, really tough one for them conceding late. Um, I think the biggest disappointment for them and, and at Arsenal as well, conceding late against Arsenal, those two goals in stoppage time. But yeah, I think the big, big disappointment for them was obviously losing to to Liverpool and then, you know, not getting a result against Tottenham either. There were two games that they would have looked at and wanted to win. Um, so probably if you look at it overall with them, I, I think no points isn't great, but actually their opposition, that's the toughest start in the WSL of, of, of any team. And then for me, the, the big team that has impressed me so far, obviously, you know, Leicester aside, is Manchester City. They They've looked like for me, the best team in the league so far. Obviously, they're going for the title. They're up there at the top of the table, level on points with, with Chelsea and Leicester. But I think Manchester City have looked very, very, very good. They only brought in one one signing in the summer, Jill yeah. Ward, who's been excellent. I know Neil's a fan of Jill Ward. Um, and yeah, she's really brought them something. Um, and yeah, I think Manchester City are so far the, the team to beat for sure. I think the I think the, the interest of Manchester City thing when we're talking about all of this is the idea that they only made one signing, mm. and they've built on where they were last season. There's, there was understandably because it it, it it sort of tails off for them a teeny little bit City like in the last campaign, you know, and they they, they struggle especially away from home against the the, the better opposition uh, City over the course of the season. It therefore sort of skewed, I think, bits and pieces of 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 what they were doing well, and I think it's interesting that they've they've decided to show uh, a little bit of patience when the chaos at times of the way in which the the, the women's summers operate, where there is so many moves, um, means that one of the things that we keep saying here is it'll take a little bit of time to get used to X, it'll take a little bit of time to get used to Y. Whereas Manchester City have decided to not gamble, gamble would overstate it, but they've decided to go with a, with with continuity. 
And it'll be interesting to see, you know, how long that can can run for them entirely. But as Emma says, I think they've started about as well as anyone around Manchester City could have hoped for. And now they've just effectively got to see if if they can find a way to to make it continue. I obviously understand that they were, you know, frustrated, obviously, with the turn of events in the match against Chelsea. But the the one of the things to take away from that is at least they don't lose it. At least they don't lose it, uh, which I think would have been would have yeah, been eminently possible. Were they down to were they down to eight before Chelsea equalised? Yeah. So you can kind of sell that to yourself a little yeah. bit. That's what it took to get past us. You can probably use that to galvanise yourself a little bit, can't you? <laughs> So I think that that's I think that that's worth bearing in mind in amongst you know in amongst all of this that they they were they were they were, they were felt obviously very very hard done to by the way in which the entirety of that game goes in terms of matters that I would just argue are out of their hands, um, mm-hmm. you know. So I, th- I I do feel as though in there I, I think that would become a top two now looking at it because I sort of feel as though Arsenal's early results as, as harsh as it is the way in which this league operates I think it's almost difficult to it can be difficult to make a bit of ground back in terms of where that'll end up but I think we will be talking about that as the top two all yeah. the way through the campaign then I think we know the two sides will finish beneath I take Emma's point completely on Villa um, and the idea that they'll, they'll, they'll almost certainly put it right uh, probably across the next little run of games they'll probably put it right and it'll look a little bit different I think we're back with Liverpool in that in this context therefore where you know more points than last season is a result and then simultaneously, if they can get a place higher than last season, if they can get themselves into sixth, that's a result. And if the opportunity is there to finish ahead of Aston Villa, then great. But I think also the other thing that the Arsenal game should give Liverpool, I think, is the idea that, especially in the FA Cup, because it does get more eyeballs, obviously, than the Conti Cup. But one way or another, Liverpool shouldn't really be scared of going anywhere and not feeling like they can get a result on any given day. Yeah, especially especially if, you know, if Chelsea and City are duking it out at the top and United and Arsenal are coming under pressure a little bit as well and league fixtures feel more important to them. You know, I think Liverpool should really be looking at, at this point, targeting the idea of a sixth and a cup run. I think a really good cup run, by the way, you know, I mean, like getting to, to a semi-final or a final, getting people genuinely excited as a trophy. I think if they can do that, then that, that's that's what I think is opening up as potentially being a really good season for Liverpool. And I think that they can do that. And I think that the Arsenal game should give them so much confidence because it was not a fluke. They, you know, they they they, they managed to restrict Arsenal's quality of chances, not amount of pressure, but quality of chances massively. And they were able to create the better chances over the course of that game, in part because of the restrictions they were putting on. And I think that they deserve enormous credit for that. And it should give them a lot, I mean, a hell of a lot of optimism as and when they play against the better sides, home or away, that they can get something. Cool. So going back to Liverpool then. So we've got a got a busy month to November. We've got uh, six games now because, um, you know, let's reorganise the Conti Cup a couple of weeks before the games kick off. So we're now looking at four home fixtures and two away fixtures. Um, and the big one's probably... The first one, which is Leicester this Sunday. Yeah, I think it's going to be a really interesting test because obviously this is this is a team, like I say, full of confidence, got an excellent manager um, who Matt Bid will know very well. He will have obviously played against a lot of Willie Kurtz teams. They have a very um, obvious style. Um, he wants them to be in possession a lot. He wants them to control games, dictate games. And that's obviously something that Liverpool have looked to do against teams outside of that kind of top four this season. You know, they controlled the ball against West Ham. Um, They did that in the first 10 minutes against Everton. Um, So that's going to be a really interesting test. And actually, it could play into Liverpool's favour because we saw them have that success last season, as Neil touched on, sort of maybe playing a little bit more expansive and having that that space and playing on the counter-attack might suit someone like Sophie Remenhard. Um, So I'm I'm intrigued to see how, how those kind of styles of play match up on the on the weekend um so yeah and the Leicester result obviously uh well sorry the, the Leicester game obviously is is a test of of where kind of both teams are at this stage given that Leicester have obviously started so well Liverpool still on paper at the start of the season Leicester's a team they should be finishing above and they will want to be finishing above um, so they need to basically shut out all that noise that Leicester, you know, level on points at the top of the table with City, Chelsea, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, it's 11 v 11. Um, Liverpool's squad, I still argue, is stronger than Leicester's. Um, so, what, you know, why not go out and win it? And they need to be playing to win that game um, because, yes, it is still early days in the season. As we've touched on, the new players are still finding their feet. Um, but it's only 22 game, 22 league 
22 game league. Um, I'll get that out eventually. So, you know, we're coming into the fifth game now. That's, you know, it's almost a quarter of the way through the season. So they need to be beating Leicester, basically. Um, and they will want to do that. Yeah, it's a sign did the double overs last last year, Neil. So again, this is another opportunity to, if you're looking for improvements on last year, this opening run we got was there was plenty of games there we go, well, where we could look to improve on from last season. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and that's in there with this this game coming up against Leicester. The other thing I point out as well is that whilst it's whilst you've got to get the business done in this context, you look at the sides that so far Tottenham have got results against. It's a Brighton side who've been leakier than they may have expected. The Aston Villa side who was stuttering in a home game against Bristol. They're the three that they've won. And I think Liverpool can look at Leicester and, and Tottenham where they're both sides who may well try to be a little bit more progressive, but obviously aren't as good as the sides that are at the very top of the WSL. And Liverpool should be able to put a plan together to pick them off uh, here and there. That's not to say Liverpool should get six points. That's not my argument. But they could certainly be targeting four from these two. And mm. it wouldn't take, you know, it wouldn't take miraculous performances uh, or unbelievable fortune to get that. I think the both the sides that, if we're talking about Liverpool coming sixth, both Leicester and Tottenham are therefore realistically sides Liverpool will need to finish ahead of. Uh, as part of that journey. So, you know, I think the idea of certainly away from home at Tottenham, points are perfectly valid, perfectly good results uh, in that context. It shouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility. Tottenham have been giving up chances in these games. They've been leaking goals themselves a little bit too, even though the results are excellent for them. So I think that, you know, those two, if Liverpool can, you know, have their way of playing... The good thing about it is sometimes fixtures fall quite nicely for you where you can probably set up for the two games relatively similarly. So you're working on the same stuff uh, through the week and then leading into that. And I think that that, you know, then it, then that ends with the away game at Chelsea, which will be very much an affair like the away game at Arsenal was, where Liverpool will have to do what I've just described against Leicester and Tottenham, but times 10. Um to feel as though they can get something from it, but they can. You know, I, I think that what the Arsenal game means is that there should be no game Liverpool go into and go, we've got to write that one off. Because I just don't think that's the case. I think there might have been an element of that last season. I don't think there is this. And I think it's important they don't do that. But I'm very much of the view, those first two, you know, the, they both present opportunities for Liverpool to pick up points. And again, you know, if, if, if the ambition is find a way to get more points than last season and find a way to get a place higher than last season. And I think that's a perfectly fine and, and, and modest ambition on the one hand, but obviously it'll be a bit of a challenge on the other. If that is there, then I think these two do present an opportunity to at the very least not lose them. But as I say, I think that four points will be will be an excellent little return. And then what will be will be against Chelsea and you shrug your shoulders on it and everyone, everyone does the best he can. Cool. And then Emma, uh, last game before the end of the month is Brighton at home. So again, that's a... A side we've done well against recently, as Neil said, they've been leakier than expected. So I would probably say of the six games we've got, Leicester at home in the league, Spurs away in the league, and then Leicester, sorry, Brighton at home in the league. They're probably the three games you're targeting to try and get in. Obviously, we all want nine points. But if you offered seven from those three, you'd be walking away more than happy. Uh, yeah, Chelsea, be tremendous. Yeah, Chelsea, what will be, will be. But we saw Chelsea away last year. We... Um, we gave Chelsea a game, I think it was 3-2, and you know, Liverpool at least made it difficult for Chelsea, made them work for it, which is something we haven't done probably in previous seasons. And then the Conte Cup will take care of itself. I kind of feel losing away to Leicester in the Conte Cup has kind of made qualification for that group quite difficult now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that is a bit disappointing because we have got a squad this season to, to challenge in the Cups. But as Neil says... Um, the FA Cup is the one that I would be going for anyway. The Conte yeah. Cup I've always seen as, as a development competition and that's where you want to bring on the likes of Mia Renderby and try and you know progress her game. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I do think you bang on. I think progression in, in the Conte Cup is probably really, really tough now. But use those games against you know the likes of Everton, City, Man United. I think that's that's in uh, they're all in the group, aren't they? So, yeah. um, excellent games to test yourselves and develop and I, what I want to see in those games is not just you know a couple of the younger players a couple of the, you know the squad players but this idea of rotating systems and changing yeah. kind of yeah you, you, the way that you want to play in games test test them in those matches um it's, it's a great opportunity um but yeah all eyes should absolutely be on the league and as you say that game against Brighton that's the big one for me in this run of games that I'd be looking at and thinking and um, that's probably the only one that anything less than three points, I think, would be a bit of a yeah. disappointment. Yeah, um, I think you're right. But yeah, as, as Neil said, four points out of Leicester and Tottenham would be excellent. Um, yeah, as you said, Chris, seven points out of those three 
yeah, I'd be I'd be really happy. Just on Emma's overall point there, you know, and that's if we did get seven from from the four games, that would put them, you know, at seven from the first four, so that puts them on fourteen in eight. You know, to be clear about it, last season it's twenty three from twenty two in yeah. total. So you know, fourteen from eight in this idea of progressing. I think would feel would feel genuinely significant, and it probably would lead mean that they were fifth or sixth. Realistically, uh, at the end of that run, get ourselves to game eight, fifth or sixth. Because again, Emma's right; Villa will find some resurgence, but they are just currently a number of points off, and it takes a bit of making up over a period of time. Mm-hmm. But the other part of that as well is, I think that if they can, if Liverpool can find a way, you know, that gets us to game eight. Then the next block of four gets us the other side of Christmas, and then we're around the, the, the FA Cup turning up. And I think that to, to Emma's point. It would be wonderful if Liverpool could put themselves in a position where they were able to say, you know what, we like where the points hall is in the league. We target the FA Cup now. We don't yeah. need to worry about anything coming from behind. And you know, if they can almost corporately at all levels of the club buy into the idea of, you know what, it'd be great, would be a genuine cup run in order to 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 not garner attention, I'd say more, sort of double down on the attention that's already there because it's growing and growing uh, every every month, I think, in terms of what Liverpool women are doing. And I think that, you know, we know that this isn't a side that's equipped to challenge Manchester City and Chelsea because, I mean, we've just sat here and also we don't think Manchester United and Arsenal are equipped to challenge Manchester City and Chelsea. But a cup run um, does have feasibility, genuine feasibility about it. So if Liverpool could get themselves a good batch of points now uh, running through these, the, 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 when we get to the turn, then it puts them in a position to be able to say, you know what, if we have to, t- if we have to rest a player in a league game so that we've got the player in the best possible nick for the cup game, we can do that, and I think that that would be a good place to be. So, you know, it sounds, it can sound as though you know you 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 you're just sort of amassing the points for their own sake if you're not careful. But I think, you know, I think the idea of Liverpool being able to target something hugely positive with silverware at the end of the second half of the season is massive. But it makes it easier if they keep getting the points. We can expect them to get or have a genuine at least level of confidence they should get if they get them now. Then it'll make the second half of the season they can switch focus a little bit more and relax in doing so. It helps in the January transfer window as well. If yeah. you think if, if you're recruiting players and you've had such a strong first half of the season and you're saying to players in January, come and join us, even if you are going to be a squad player or you're competing or whatever, we're building our depth because we want to be competing in the cup competitions in the second half and look at our first half, we're going upwards, this is progression. And yeah, that's that's only a good thing for with the January window coming around as well. Yeah, brilliant. So with Leicester at home then, Emma, um, any sort of, Big squad concerns. Obviously, we've, we've seen today Kerry Holland's injury in incident actually doesn't seem like it's as, as bad as first feared, but it, I think she's going to get the impression she's touch and go for Sunday, which is going to be a, a bit of a blow, but you know, it's going to interest to see how Liverpool adapt to that. I'm, I never like to see a Liverpool side without Kerry Holland in it, but yeah. I am at least I look at the squad going, but we have now yeah. got options where you're going, oh, if you actually do you know what, we'll have to put Missy Bow, we'll put Missy Bow in the mid centre bed. Sound. Um, yeah. Whereas probably two years ago we'll be going, oh, do you know that's kind of the, that's kind of the heartbeat of the team got out there. So not that I want Kerry Hall not available, but you do sort of look now thinking there are at least now options where it shouldn't be as as devastating as it normally feels when Kerry Holland gets an injury. Yeah, bang on. That was my exact thought. Was I thought not not good news at all. You don't want Kerry Holland going, but there's cover there now. And I watched Missy Bow. Um, played for the under 23s. Obviously, she's captain of, of England under 23s. I saw her play against Portugal on Monday night at the uh, the Manchester City um, Academy Stadium, and uh, and she looked really sharp on the ball, playing in centre mid. Made some really really nice touches, um, sort of in and around the box. So um, I think I think she's ready to you know to kind of play in that. I think she wants to play in that midfield role. I think she's enjoyed playing you know in a, in an attacking role, but I think she wants to take ownership. I've heard her speak a lot about. Kind of being a leader this season and having that responsibility with the with the national team. Um, she wants that with Liverpool. She wants to wear the armband in the future. So um, I think I think she looks up for it this season. So I, I have no concerns on that part. I think she will slot in. I don't think Kerry will play. I think even if she is miraculously fit enough, which I don't think she will be fully fit, um, I, there's no way. I think you know, Matt would risk her with this period of games that we've just discussed coming up. Yeah. Um, what's what's the point? You know, you've got a very, very capable player like Bo ready to come in. So I think I think Bo will will come in. And um yeah, and I think from now on now I think Sophie is is, you know, is a starting striker. So I expect her to start again. And I don't really expect any any other changes to kind of what we've seen. I think I think the bat the battery will be the same. Yeah. 
just touching on Bo, um, I will probably say, look at the first opening four games that has been, which is natural because she's a, a young player, is a real natural progression and maturity in, in her development as a player. Because mm -hmm. even when she's played up front, which is not her natural position, she plays that role diligently and how you want her to be. And I kind of feel she sort of emphasised this team maturing and growing into the WSL because I think you've seen that with Bo, Bo this season. You know, it needs to be highlighted because I think the start of last season, I think it was just tough getting used to the level. She wasn't the only one. Uh, but I think you've seen probably since last Christmas, Bo's levels go up another level, which is quite a scary proposition, really, because, you know, she has such a high ceiling as a player. And I think Neil pointed out on our last show, um, because she's now captain of the 23, she's probably now looking going, it's probably an England spot, probably an England senior spot for me if I yeah. keep developing the way I go, which, you know, because you do look at that squad thinking, you can see someone like a Missy Bow being useful in tournament football. Yeah, I mean, they need midfielders in that England senior squad and she knows that. And, you know, I know that the under-23s have very, very close contact with Serena Beekman. So that is absolutely a priority of Missy Bow. She's said this a few times now. So absolutely, that's top of the list. But the, the big thing for me with her is, not just is she developing as a player, I think she's finding her role within this team. And I think that's really important. You know, even last season, definitely the season before in the championship, I think she was playing for herself and not, you know, not in a negative way. I think she was looking at where can I improve as an individual? Now she's looking at, okay, what skill sets do I need to improve in certain positions to help the team as a whole? And I think that's where her game has developed. Everything that she does, she does to enhance the qualities of the team and to bring out the strengths of, of the team as opposed to herself as an individual. I think she looks fitter, you know, and that, I think that you oh, can, yeah. I think you can, you know, it's worth saying, obviously we, we, we haven't seen the sort of the benefits of the, the shift in facilities yet, but I just think to the eye, she in general looks fitter, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, people grow into the bodies um, through different phases. It's one of the reasons why I, for instance, think Enderby is so exciting in that she's got a, a sharpness mm -hmm. about her that if you add quality uh, training along with just natural growth and, there's still, you know, to one of our themes that we come back to occasionally on this show is there still actually isn't arguably enough sports science data, data out there as to how women's elite sports and bodies develop and, and how you need to care for them. But it's improving all the time uh, it, just because it has to in practice. And I think that, you know, for me, Missy just looks, she just looks like she's fitter. And I think that that, that makes a difference. I think, you know, it's part of why that midfield, when she's in it with Kerry, can help. It's also a direction of travel. I think in general for this Liverpool side, especially if they're going to look to press aggressively and, you know, you look at, it's not a ton of games, uh, but you look at last season and this season, you know, Kearns is amongst the highest in the country in terms of pressures and pressure regains. And if she's a little sharper again, even on top of last season, then I think that she's she's a genuine weapon in that area. It's then whether or not she's got enough players around her when she does win it back high. For Liverpool to be able to turn that into something, but I thought for 10 minutes, the first 10 minutes of the Merseyside derby, you got to see what that could look like yeah. from a Liverpool point of view. The issue is A, how long can you keep it up for? And B, it's not just the idea, it, like everyone's got to keep it up because if, if you want to play a high press game and one of your players finds it difficult when you get past minute 16, but the other three or four don't, well, it drags everyone's level down, no matter how well the other three or four are hanging in. If one can't press quite as intensively as she could uh, five minutes ago, then that's where they'll find the way to play out the opposition, get up the pitch. And then everyone's energy level sapped because it feels like, well, we just can't get there now. Whereas, it, you know, so I think that Liverpool have still got to work bits and pieces of that out as well. But again, you've got to see the direction of travel. As you have, I would argue, in all three of the games, maybe not quite the Arsenal game because Liverpool were doing something else, although that does also, the goal there does come from Liverpool starting the second half pretty quickly and, and being, being able to be aggressive around Arsenal and snap into them a little bit more. But I think the other three games where they're not quite up against opposition of that class, I think you get to see that Liverpool do want to do that. That'll take time to improve and develop and get absolutely right as to where Liverpool want it. Not least because, as we keep coming back to, you're constantly dropping new players in as well. So not everyone knows the triggers. Not everyone knows where they are at all times. Not everyone knows this is when we go, this is when we stay. But I think with Cairns, I think you've got to, as I say, I think that she's just looked fitter. Cool, cool. Right, I'll keep you guys for an hour now. I think I think I should let you go and have, some, have a cup of tea because I tell Emma's down for a brew now. Well, I'm actually I'm off to Birmingham now, so I'm going to have to leave oh, the house no. in about 15 minutes. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take them to the road. <laughs> good, good, good. But listen, um, Neil, thank 
Pleasure. Uh, thanks for coming, Joe. Obviously, you guys know you can find Neil and Anfield Rappy because all this all this great stuff that we do on there. And Emma, obviously, you you on the Beeb? Any new articles coming out that people need to keep an eye out for? Yeah, there's a couple. I'm actually doing one on on the under 23s from that game, um, just about the development and the pathway to the first team. So, um, yeah, that's probably one to one to look out for. I'd say. Good, good, good. Is it at M Sandy, isn't it? Yeah. There underscore go, Sandy. Underscore <laughs> Sandy. There, I always get it wrong. There you go. So keep an eye out for that. M stuff really good, especially if you want to learn more and more about the women's game. It's good to keep an eye on M stuff on Twitter. Right, until then, guys, thanks very much, and we'll see you all very, very soon.